Hi, this is the mass production Moog Subharmonicon. A six oscillator paraphonic synth inspired by the Tritonium, an instrument that could generate subharmonics, and the Rhythmicon, an instrument that explored polyrhythms. And it has a few neat tricks up its sleeve compared to the workshop edition reviewed on this channel two years ago. In this video, I'll take a look at it from the ground up, explore a few patch ideas and modular pairings, and I even have a special guest appearance from Heinbach. Let's get started. The first order of business is to address what the subharmonic series is. For a bit of background, the harmonic series is a set of tones at frequencies which are multiples of a fundamental tone and occur naturally in nature, for example, when you pluck a guitar string. And in synths, we can take a look at a sawtooth waveform. I've got the fundamental set to around 100 hertz, and if I turn up the resonance, I can pick off the harmonics. You can hear them at 200 hertz, 300 hertz, 400 hertz, and so on in this case. At whole number or integer multiples of the fundamental frequency, note that the series are the same note in an octave above, then a fifth above that, then another octave, then a third, and so on. Now, subharmonics don't appear naturally in sounds and work in the opposite direction. So let's, in this case, start with a higher frequency. <laughs> Just turn this off. So let's take a listen to these subharmonics. I'll filter it. So we start with a high C, then there's a C an octave below, then an F, and a C two octaves below. And this is where it gets interesting. An A flat, which is about 14 cents sharp. Then another F. Then a D, which is definitely 30 plus cents sharp. Another C. B flat, which is slightly flatter. Again, A flat, slightly sharp. F sharp, very sharp. F, E, and the notes bunch up all the way down to C which is the 16th subdivision of the fundamental frequency. These subharmonics are what give the subharmonic on its special character, this oddly tuned scale, generated entirely by whole subdivisions and has intervals that aren't very natural to our ears, especially the further down we travel the subdivisions. Another thing that makes the subharmonic on unique is that it uses the same subharmonic principles in its sequencer with subharmonic or basically clock divisions of the main clock and mixing those into polyrhythmic structures. More on that later. Let's first step back and take a look at this overall. The subharmonicon is a six oscillator paraphonic synth, meaning that its oscillators can play together, but they're fed through the same filter and VCA, unless you patch it otherwise, of course. It has a fully analog signal path, but parts of it are digitally controls, which mean you can control some of its functions over MIDI as well. It doesn't have any presets though, so whenever you look at the panel, what you see is what you get, and you should be able to recreate everything I do here at home. It has two main oscillators that can be tuned to pretty much any frequency you want. And then it has subharmonic oscillators, four of them. That you can mix together. Now the subharmonic oscillators always follow the main oscillator. So if I lower everything down on oscillator two, just listen to oscillator one and turn it up, you can hear that. This is the fundamental frequency, subharmonic one, subharmonic two, and they move together as you transpose the oscillator. Same deal for this oscillator. The oscillators go through the mixer section into the filter and then onto the VCA with an attack decay envelope for both the filter and the VCA. More on this later. Then on the sequencer side, each oscillator group, right, there are two groups, gets its own sequencer. 
There are four steps to each sequence that may sound limiting, but these sequencers can be clocked through multiple polyrhythmic clock generators, meaning that they can generate patterns that are much longer than just four steps. Then finally, for the overview on the right side is a patch bay, which has 15 outputs and 17 inputs. So you can rewire the synth internally in quite a few different ways, as well as pair it with other modular or semi-modular gear to substantially enhance its functionality. One of these inputs is a MIDI in through a 3.5 millimeter jack using the TRS-A standard, so you can hook up a MIDI keyboard or controller to it. And finally, for the overview, the subharmonicon can be taken out of this enclosure and mounted into a Eurorack case. While it's in its enclosure, it has a quarter inch mono line output in the back. Okay, so let's dive into the details of the components very quickly. I'll start with the oscillator section. Remember, there are two oscillators. The two halves, oscillator one and oscillator two, are completely identical. We already talked about how the two sub oscillators follow the main oscillator. In each half, you have three wave shape options for each of the main oscillators and sub oscillators. At the top position of this three-way switch, all three oscillators are square. At the bottom position, all three are sawtooth. And if we listen just to the sub oscillator, there's nothing weak or different about it. it sounds just as mogey as the rest of them. And then in the middle position, something interesting happens. The main fundamental oscillator is a square wave shape, but it has pulse width modulation control by oscillator one. Now both sub oscillators in this position are sawtooth. So what it does typically in audio rates is give it a very harsh sound, which is nice. If you lower the frequency a lot, you could get slow pulse width modulation. But this isn't your uh, mother's pulse width modulation because this is a sawtooth waveform and most of the time you'll have both of these at higher frequencies. You can override this connection with a dummy cable and then the fundamental will be a square and the sub oscillators will be saws and you can plug in an LFO to this to have classic pulse width modulation. Right down the center of the oscillator section live a few controls that apply to both oscillators. Quantization has five options when none of these LEDs is lit. There's no quantization, and then you can have either a equal temperament scale that moves chromatically or diatonically. And then the other two options are similar, meaning either chromatic, right? 12 notes in a scale or diatonic, seven or eight notes in an octave, depending on how you look at it. And the difference in the tunings is that ET stands for equal temperament. That's what we're typically used to hearing in modern Western scales. And if you look at the tuner, you can see we're more or less in tune with every semitone that we go up or with any note in an octave, the white keys can seven or eight of them, depending on how you look at it. Whereas in the JI or just intonation options here, notes are tuned based on mathematical ratios to the root note of the scale. Now, since subharmonics are also based on mathematical ratios to the root note of the scale or whatever you're playing, the two tend to align better when playing quantized to just intonation. Let's just see briefly what this looks like under a tuner as we go through the semitones of a just intonation scale. You can see the notes are slightly off and the intervals are somewhat similar to the subharmonic, sometimes exactly. Remember our A flat, that's a little bit sharp, about 14 cents sharp. And the B flat, which was just a little bit flat. So based on what you do with both oscillator sides, just intonation may work better than 
equal temperament. The other controls on the oscillator section, these three buttons and then these LEDs, relate to how the sequencer impacts each of the oscillators. So remember I mentioned that there are two sequencers. Sequencer one goes to oscillator one, sequencer two goes to oscillator two, obviously all by default. You can reroute that over here. So these toggles enable or disable control of either the main oscillator or the sub oscillators by the sequencer. So for example, if I wanted the sequencer only to control the frequency of the main oscillator, then I would have only this LED on. And of course the subharmonics will follow. But if I turned only the subharmonic control on, then as I turn this, the fundamental frequency remains the same. And what I control with the sequencer is the subharmonic played in relation to the fundamental frequency of the oscillator. Now, seek octave or sequencer octave determines how these knobs impact the main oscillator. Because these knobs are pretty small, they're hard to control over a broad range. So you can have them control either a plus minus five octave range, so a 10 octave range overall, or if you wanna be more precise, you can set it to plus minus two octaves, or just plus minus one octave. This function applies to both oscillators. A quick word about the mixer section before we head out to the VCA. As you turn the knobs clockwise, they'll start to distort, especially as we overload this with more content. So you can hear the distortion there. This is without. Okay, so let's talk about the filter and VCA. Like I mentioned, classic Moog 24 dB per octave ladder filter. Listen to it on one oscillator if you like. And um, yeah, it has resonance. Notice the drop in bass as you increase resonance. Like I mentioned, it will self-oscillate beyond uh, sort of seven or eight here, even if it's not getting any input from the mixer. With a sine wave. And it has an envelope to modulate the filter cutoff frequency over time with controls over the attack and decay times of this envelope, as well as bipolar depth control. So if depth is positive, attack will move the filter cutoff frequency up and decay will bring it back down. This being the attack phase and the decay, bringing it down and negative mod depth will do the opposite. Attack will bring the filter cutoff down and then decay will bring it back up. You probably noticed the sustain stage in the middle, so as long as I keep the gate open or the trigger pressed, the note will be sustained at maximum attack or mod depth, and as I release it, the decay stage starts. A simple trigger will always take the envelope the full route. Then beyond that, the VCA also has attack decay control. Pretty straightforward, a slow attack. We'll bring it in gradually in a slow decay. We'll have it die down gradually. These envelopes always trigger together. You can't trigger them separately and there's no LFO. So that's pretty much it for the filter and modulation section. Let's talk about the sequencer. Like I mentioned before, two sequencers, one for each oscillator. The sequencers derive their clock from the master clock, from the master tempo. But if I hit play, nothing is gonna happen for two reasons. First, the envelope generator is off. But secondly, we haven't yet triggered any of the polyrhythm generators. You do that by turning on their connection to either sequencer one or to sequencer two. Now remember I mentioned they work just like the subharmonic oscillators. If you turn them all the way to the right, then they have a one-to-one -one ratio to the master clock. So if I hit play, which is on, and then turn on sequencing for sequencer one from polyrhythmic generator one, then it'll have a one-to-one -one relationship to the speed of the clock of the master clock as determined here or through this input or through MIDI. But if I turn this counterclockwise, it'll start slowing down to one every two clock pulses, one every three clock pulses, and then slower and slower and slower all the way to 16 subdivisions, which if I increase tempo, 
we'll hear more frequently, obviously. Now, the interesting thing about the subharmonicon is that there are four of these, which we can set to different speeds and link to each of the sequencers. So let's, for example, turn on this polyrhythmic generator and set it to a different rate. And you can see now, both of them are impacting sequence one. Okay, so this is just polyrhythmic generator one, then just polyrhythmic generator two, and now both of them together. So notice that even though it's a four step sequencer, we're getting a much more complex pattern. Now, up until now, we've only been listening to and sequencing one oscillator. We can, of course, bring in the second one. And you can always listen to the oscillators by holding the trigger button and seeing if the ratios you get are pleasing or not. So now you can listen to oscillator two in parallel to oscillator one. It's not changing yet. Again, further experimentation. We first need to get this sequencer moving, right? Because right now it's not controlling the oscillators and it's not changing. Let's maybe assign it to oscillator one. And uh, yeah, let's get it moving. So those are pretty much the principles of the subharmonicon. Before we head out to uh, some patch ideas, let's look at a few hidden features that might be useful. A long press on the envelope generator button opens up the VCA so you can listen to all the oscillators if you want, or fewer. Tune them uh, in relation to one another. Build nice. Chords. Just hunt around the subharmonic spectrum looking for sweet spots. If you press both the oscillator buttons for a bit, then this will start blinking and you use the tempo knob to tune the subharmonic on. It's just nicely tuned. And there are a few other hidden features that are only available by sending MIDI CCs through the MIDI input. For example, there's an XOR or exclusive OR clock option, which causes the clock to ignore a trigger that comes from two polyrhythmic generators at once. Okay, let's take a look at the patch bay and a few patch ideas. Outputs are marked with inverse text and inputs with regular text. And this is a MIDI input, a TRSA MIDI input, so you can plug in a MIDI keyboard and controller. So let's explore a few ideas. Since the subharmonicon doesn't have an LFO, an interesting way to sort of generate an LFO effect is to separate the envelopes from each other and use the clock to trigger and then maybe set a slow VCF filter attack and a fast VCA attack. Because of the way that the attack portion of the envelopes work here, it doesn't reset every note. The trigger will keep triggering the notes, but the VCF attack won't re-trigger. And the result is kind of like a sawtooth LFO that will gradually open up the filter across a few notes. And it will go slower as you increase the filter attack. Another simple patch idea, you can sequence anything, not just notes. So if I take the output of either sequence one or sequence two, plug that into say the cutoff of the filter, I can sequence different filter positions, bring some more life into the pattern. And then if you really want to mess things up, maybe connect one of the envelope generators to one of the polyrhythmic generators, which is a nice way to make sequences that speed up and slow down based on the envelope control. Next tip, in this patch I created a sequence that's longer than four steps on only one of the oscillators, freeing up the other one by pointing both sequences into oscillator one 
sequencer 1 into the main frequency of VCO1 and sequencer 2 into the first subharmonic of oscillator 1. Having them run at different speeds creates the longer sequence. Where I think you can take the subharmonic on much farther is by pairing it to other stuff, to other modules or other semi-modular gear. An easy pairing I mentioned before, if you want pulse width modulation for any of the VCOs, just grab an LFO, plug it into the pulse width modulation input, and presto PWM, you can determine the rate on any LFO and the mod depth as well, ideally because there's no attenuator on the input here. So pulse width modulation is easily accessible if you want it. Another neat patch idea is to use one of the sequencers for something else completely. So let's maybe use sequencer two over here. I'll take its clock to trigger a kick on sample drum here. So if I hit play here, I can get a simple kick. I can obviously increase the clock here or change the tempo subdivision to change the speed of the kick. Now the slight problem with this is that the kick also triggers the VCA and VCF envelopes and if we don't want that, we can bypass it. So first step to bypassing it is turning off the envelope generator. We're still getting clock and the kick over here. Then I can patch the clock of sequencer one to trigger the envelope generator whenever I want it. So now sequencer one is controlling this section, sequencer two, strictly controlling the kick. So now if I hit play, I get long nodes here, and the kick isn't interfering with whatever's going on here. Next up, if you wanna swap the sequencer with one that has more than four steps, that's certainly possible. Both sequencers send polyrhythmic clock out, and you can send voltage back in to both of the main oscillators and VCO1 sub oscillator one and VCO2 sub oscillator one. So with a little help from friends, it's certainly possible to use an external longer sequencer. Next up, the subharmonic on as is, is a paraphonic synth, meaning that it can play six different notes together sharing the same filter and VCA envelopes. However, you can't currently in the current MIDI implementation play it paraphonically. Let's just maybe shut down a few of the sub oscillators. So we've got two oscillators here, but if you press two notes on a MIDI keyboard, it'll just transpose them together. Now hopefully they'll add duophonic support in a future firmware update, but if you have a MIDI to CV converter, both VCO1 and VCO2 can be controlled independently of each other. An alternative to a MIDI to CV converter is a keyboard that could send out polyphonic CV. Here I've got two voices patched into the two main oscillators and the gate of voice one controlling the trigger. Ideally, you'd merge the gates of both voices so they both keep the single VCA and VCF open as long as you're playing. In this case, I'll keep it simple. I've got a keyboard split down the middle. Yeah, in this way, the subharmonicon is a fully playable paraphonic synth. With each of the halves in this case playing not only single notes, but chords based on subharmonic intervals. Another pairing I think well worth trying is a separate VCA and filter with their own envelopes so that each oscillator gets its own voice. Just like I triggered a kick here, I could trigger an envelope generator and a filter and VCA that take one of the oscillators and treat them polyphonically completely separately than the other group of oscillators. If you want the two sequencers to control each voice separately as well, so one doesn't trigger the other, don't forget the rhythmic bypass trick I showed you earlier, disable the envelope generator hook up the sequencer clock to the trigger and the other sequencer clock to whatever other external envelope generator you're using. Another patch idea I thought would be fun to try would be to use the sequencer for polyrhythmic subharmonic shifting of a sequence coming from an external sequencer or arpeggiator. So let me explain. I've got a simple pattern going here with an arpeggiator. Okay, just doing that. 
Now, the patch I've got here is pitch out of key step going into VCO1 pitch, trigger triggering the envelope, and then clock sync so that the clock of the key step is in sync with the clock of the subharmonicon. Now, as long as the sequencer is off, the pattern will just play. But if I turn the sequencer on, it'll start stepping through the pattern here at a clock rate that I determine here. So I can slow this down if I, uh, speed it up, sorry, if I wanted or slow it down. And then once I start making changes here, the sequence will be transposed at the rate of this sequence. So I can increase the rate of this sequence. They get very interesting rhythmic results as the clock of the key step plays against the polyrhythmic subharmonic shifting of the internal sequencer of the subharmonicon. By the way, currently this doesn't work well over MIDI because of note off behavior that I understand may change, so your best bet to get this effect is to do it over CV. A final pairing before I get to the pros and cons is effects. In the outro and intro to this video, I applied a reverb and timed delay to the subharmonicon, and Heinbach has kindly agreed to take a little subharmonic jam I sent him and contribute more ideas here, so I'll pass you over to him for just a bit. Hi, I'm Heinbach. Thank you, Lupop, for having me. The history of early electronic music and the instruments, how they were played, how they were used, and the thoughts behind them is a topic that has been fascinating to me for a long time. So I dove into the world of Oskar Zala, who played the Mixtur Trautonium and later the Transistor Trautonium. And I discovered some very interesting things that I applied in the track that I did together with Lupop. For example, in his later years especially, Oskar Zala made great use of harmonizers in the same way that the subharmonicum divides notes downwards. With a harmonizer, it's possible to go in the other direction. Another important thing that I noticed in regards to the trautonium are the formant filters. They give it their vowelly, very alive sound. And that's something that's missing on the subharmonicum. So I try to, and I'm experimenting with, bandpass filters to get some of those vowels back. For a track together, I combined these techniques. First, bandpass filters. And then a fifth from an even tight harmonizer. This makes for a more surreal and beautiful feel. <laughs> 
Thanks very much, Heinbach. Let's wrap up by talking about a few pros and cons. On the cons side, I think it's probably the things that I solved in the pairing ideas section that are things you need to be aware of before you get this. So certainly a longer sequencer would have been nice. Of course, the polyrhythmic features of the sequencer do a lot to mitigate this, but still more steps in a sequence would have been nice. I don't know if it's possible in a future firmware update, but it would be pretty neat if you could take these two sequencers and chain them into one. So at least optionally, you could try this as one long eight step sequence. Another con, at least currently, if you wanna play the subharmonicon completely paraphonically on a keyboard, you can only do that through control voltage like I showed you earlier and not through MIDI. Potentially this is possible with a firmware update. Regarding the layout, I think it's very convenient. The only qualm I have here is that the tempo knob probably should have been up here and these sequencers should have been down here. I find myself using these more than this and sometimes occasionally accidentally changing the tempo. On the pros side, there are three things that make the subharmonicon stand out as a synth. First, the sheer amount of oscillators. The second is the unique tuning and character of its subharmonic scales. And the third is its polyrhythmic sequencer. Subharmonicon is a great multi-oscillator synth on its own and a nice pairing to its siblings, Mother32 and DFAM. It adds both the ability to produce chords and the character of the subharmonics, which you just can't get with regular synths. Further on the pros side, for a synth by Moog in this form factor is MIDI control over some of the parameters like the oscillator tuning and subharmonics and a few additional parameters. Now, of course, this is where I get greedy and want MIDI control over everything, like the filter cutoff, which isn't available because this is an analog connection directly to the filter. And also there's no MIDI out or MIDI over USB. So while you can send the subharmonic on MIDI commands for tuning, there's no way of recording the knob motions onto a computer to edit later on, which would have been nice, of course. All that said, any MIDI control over synth parameters is welcome. Overall, if you've been following this channel, you know I'm pretty obsessed with subharmonics and how they sound ever since I built the original workshop, Subharmonicon, and this improves on it on many ways, both in terms of connectivity, direct control, MIDI control. If you have a chance to try this out, I highly recommend it. Beyond that, if you enjoyed the patch ideas in this video, there are plenty more in my ever-expanding book available to the people who support this channel on Patreon. Hit like if this was useful. Feel free to ask me anything in the comment section below. Ring the bell after subscribing to make sure you don't miss the next one. Thanks for watching.